because the easiest way to suck in jujitsu is to get injured and not train. You know, if you if you want to find someone like a, a really quick path to sucking, just don't show up. What's the most efficient possible victory against this particular opponent? He's dropping off the choke here. We could see the finish. It's looking tight. Tight at Delbrook. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Essential Jiu-Jitsu Podcast. I am Matt Kwan, your host. The Essential Jiu-Jitsu Podcast is everything you need to know about Jiu-Jitsu. And today I have a very special guest, John Danaher, third degree black belt, Mr. Brian Glick. Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Um, so I've been a big fan of yours for a while. Uh, we're going to discuss training, uh, pedagogy, takedowns for jiu-jitsu, amongst other topics. Before we get into that, guys, I would like to please ask you to like, share, and subscribe. If you like the show, uh, there's links in the bottom. You can support the show by getting merchandise, subscribing to my online academy, or my PayPal is at the bottom if you want to leave a donation. And at the end of the show, we'll talk about how you can reach uh, Brian and, and uh, check out his content as well. So, uh, Mr. Glick, it's great to finally have you on the show. And I just wanted to get, I guess I'll just get your uh, background information for those who don't know. When and where did you start martial arts? Did you start at Henzo's? Uh, was Professor Danaher your first instructor? Go, the floor is yours. Yeah, you got it. So um, that, that's exactly right. I started jujitsu um, back in 2000 and I had heard about it because I I had an acquaintance who was actually studying Gracie Jiu Jitsu at the time, uh, end of the 90s. Um, and he was out in California. So it was Horion and the Torrance Academy. And at the time, you know, there are so many instructional videos out now, but at the time, there was really only one or two video series. You know, there was the um, Horion, uh, his self defense Gracie Jiu Jitsu series. And um, Henzo and Craig Kukok had one. And then there was Gracie in action. And that those videos are still out there. And I, I still think that they're incredibly valuable. Um, they're not they're not quite as, obviously quite as modern as some of the stuff that's out now. But they're really, in terms of uh, instruction, and we talked, you know, you mentioned pedagogy. In terms of like teaching and delivering information, those things are really amazing. Um, and... So this, this friend of mine had, had encouraged me to, um, you know, we, we had had a conversation and, uh, and I had never done any martial arts before, but he was really enthusiastic. And I think that even now, you know, a lot of the people, probably some, uh, a lot of the people who are listening to this and maybe even you, um, you know, we find out about jujitsu and, and martial arts through people who do it already, you know, kind of like word of mouth. And so that's just what this was. This guy was a, a practitioner he was a fan of it and he was really enthusiastic so he was like oh you know if you're thinking about trying it um there's a school somewhere in manhattan and this was in you know 2000 the internet was not there wasn't really a thing you know um so he didn't know exactly where it was i think he maybe knew it was henzo and i went to the phone book like the yellow pages and i you know went through and i found they had just moved from um, there was a shared space that they had, I think, like end of the 90s through 2000. And they had just moved from that space into their new space. And the yellow pages still listed the old space. So I, I went there and they were like, you know, no, they said, no, they had they had just moved. And they gave me the new address. And I walked in and it was, this was the uh, methadone clinic. So it was like the third floor of a building. A second floor was actually a methadone clinic. So it was an unusual clientele mix, a lot of jujitsu people and, you know, people who were either in the throes of drug addiction or recovering from and a lot of people down on their luck. And, uh, and then there was also the methadone clinic. And so then <laughs> when I walked in, um, there was some guy at the desk who was this kind of hulking beefy guy with long hair. And I said, you know, I wanted to try jujitsu and he gave me a record, gave me, you know, passed a schedule to me, was kind of terse and didn't say too much and told me to come back at, you know, whenever the next class was, happened to be a John Danaher. And the next class I came to I actually was working at the time um, in the evening. So I couldn't make the evening classes, the evening classes at Henzo's back in those days, 
those were the classes where um, all the killers were. You know, if you if you were coming, Henzo was teaching, uh, Matt Sarah, Nick Sarah, Ricardo Almeida, um, uh, Danner himself was training then um, in those classes. Sean Williams, anyone who was a guest would come through in the evenings, and I just wasn't able to get there. So there were daytime classes, thankfully. And those were the classes that I ended up attending. And those classes were taught at the time by uh, Danaher and Sean Williams. So those were my first two instructors. And it just happened to be that that, that was the place and that was the time. And those were the days I could do it. And then I, I stuck to that schedule for years and years and almost 20 years. You know, I stuck to that schedule and just didn't look back. I looked back a couple of times, but not much. Would you say that having those daytime classes, like, because it's, I don't know if recreational is the, is the way that I would describe the crowd that went to those classes, but you had mentioned that the the pros were going in the evenings. Um, did you have like more, uh, I don't know if one-on-one time is the way I'd choose to describe it, but could you get more uh, individual attention from John Danaher because you attended that, that time? You know, I- at the time, so a couple things, and I think that it's hard to remember this, but at the time that I started, he was a purple belt. He and Sean Williams were purple belts. So I was going to a, you know, a noon class taught by two purple belts. And I think that that there was not really a sense of, um, hard to describe, but there wasn't a sense of anything really momentous going on. It was very nuts and bolts, chop wood, carry water kind of training where the people who were coming to those classes in some ways, yeah, you know, they weren't the pros, but on the other side of it, they didn't, I don't think they had broad aspirations for some kind of bigger thing. And remember at the time also, this is, you know, in 2000, 2001, 2002, there wasn't anything really except MMA, you know, and the MMA at the time was pretty brutal. I mean, it was like pride, um, you know, kind of the, this was the era where it was like Gracie's versus Japan and pride and Sakuraba was beating everybody. And um, so it was that. And then even UFC at the time in 2000, 2001 was not really, it wasn't even a shadow of what it is now. But that said, you know, coming to those those daytime classes, there wasn't really a sense of um, it was a professional environment in the sense that we were all there and really kind of serious about training, most of us. But it it didn't carry all of this other stuff. So I don't know that I had more individual. I did. I think I did have more individual time because the classes were not as well attended because fewer people are just hanging around during the day. Mm-hmm. Um, but. So I think maybe that was cut, that that was like a side effect, but more broadly, it was very much it had very much the feeling of a lab a laboratory, in that there was plenty of room to stretch out and test and try, and ultimately to suck for a longer time. I think that there were times where I would you know I I would go to those classes in the evenings if I had off from work or if my schedule was upside down, and. There's a lot, there was a lot of pressure there and in a lot of ways, that's good. And I think ultimately later on the blue basement, there was a lot of pressure, even in the daytime classes, kind of things flipped around. But when you don't have that much pressure, especially for someone, it, I think it suited my temperament pretty well. Um, You were able to spend a little bit more time figuring things out without feeling like, you know, some big name was going to come by and just smash you for for living. So Mm -hmm. that I think it was, it ultimately it was, it was to my benefit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I think the best training environments are like how you described a laboratory where everyone's just trying to find, I don't know if the truth is the word, but uh, the best way to do something, they're willing to go through the trial and error to, to, to find, you know, the next, the next detail or the next solution to a problem. And everyone's kind of contributing um, and serious about doing that. That's a good culture to have. Do you have experience in other martial arts? No, not really. Um, 
you know, I, I do judo, I've done judo and that is an outgrowth of my jujitsu practice. I didn't have a separate track that I was on for judo where I decided that I was going to cross train judo necessarily. I spent a long time, you know, it was like, I, I really, and I know not everybody does this and, um, especially now I think the culture of how people train and practice jujitsu and how they relate to um, their instructors or teachers or professors everybody has it kind of a different way I've always been uh, willing and like very happy to turn my progress over to my teacher that's just how I Again, it's a, no one told me that I needed to do that. It just seemed to me the right way to learn something that I really wanted to know was to find someone who seemed to be knowledgeable and able to, to communicate it and translate it and, and to share it and then to kind of get out of the way and let them do that. And then, so the reason that I'm bringing this up is because around Purple Belt, um, you know, Mr. Danaher was like, he didn't intro. He was just, we started doing stand up. We started doing, uh, you know, judo stuff. And that was what he was showing. And that was what we were training. And that was what he was teaching. And that's what I was looking for. And that, so there was, that was really the beginning of it. And as a result, even though I am a judo practitioner, I came to it through a, through the back door of jujitsu where the stuff that I learned, um, in in judo has a very jujitsu kind of approach uh and again it's not art not in an artificial sense but just this is how i learned so for instance um and we can get more into takedowns i know that you you had mentioned that we wanted to talk about that but you know like i never really learned how to do uh, a good morote uh senagi or like a good Ipon Sinagi. I, I never really learned the mechanics of those things. I didn't spend much time practicing them. I spent a lot of time doing like Tomoe Nagi, which in judo is kind of like a, you know, it's like a second tier technique. Most of the time it's considered like a bailout technique, something you go to when like the rest of your stuff has failed. But that was like a primary focus because it fits so well with the, the practice of jujitsu. Ultimately, um, after I had been doing maybe a year or two of that i was i did some formal judo training under uh sensei shina who in new york and particularly in brooklyn was a huge um as a huge figure here in new york there were four or five japanese uh, judoka who who were sent over from japan at in the 60s as really diplomats, emissaries of judo. And th this happened across the world, but particularly in like the tri-state area, there were a couple of guys. Mr. Shina was one. Uh, Mr. Higashi was another. Mr. Yuneska was another one. Still, his, his son's school um, is still in Cranford in New Jersey. Uh, Mr. Oishi, Mr. Matsumura. And those guys were really the foundation of judo in this area. So Mr. Shina who is now in his, I don't know, like 80s. I, so I, I did some formal training with him later on. One of his students, uh, who is himself now like almost 70s, uh, was a, in, the, in the Olympics in uh, Montreal, which I think was 1976, was time off John Sonono. So I did judo with him, and I did judo with the St. Ledger brothers and with uh, Shintaro. So I did kind of develop some judo practice over the years, but like I was saying, it kind of came through this weird filter of jujitsu and what was most important for, for, for jujitsu. And, um, so my judo developed in a kind of unorthodox way. Do you feel, um, what do you think is like, if let's say, you know, I'm a uh, blue belt level, but I don't have takedowns. I want to incorporate yeah. takedowns into my game. Should I go into judo training? Should I go to wrestling? Uh, do, do you have a preference of one over the other? Uh, should I try and do both? What's your opinion yeah. on that for someone who is like, let's say blue belt level and they just need to get like some confidence and some, some game on the feet. What, what would you recommend? Yeah, I, I think, the best of all worlds in an ideal world is having a 
jujitsu instructor who has started to synthesize some of those the tool the best tools from both wrestling and jujitsu and judo into a jujitsu context. So rather than um, trying to uh, you know set out on your own to figure out what's the best thing if if I were a blue belt again, and we can talk about you know that too. But I think the best the the best of all worlds is the the jujitsu professor who understands stand up. And they don't need to be master, you know, a master necessarily. They need to understand just kind of what what are the tools that you need in order to be able to function well in the standing position. Functioning well means, to me, means you're safe. Uh, so you're not getting injured either being taken down or in the taking down. Both of those things are totally possible to get injured in either the, the doing or the receiving. Um and then um, kind of eliminating some of the, the techniques that are just you don't really need that aren't going to be helpful. And then also narrowing it down so that you can spend the, the precious little time that you have left over after trying to understand how to do groundwork in an area that's going to be effective. So that's like the best case scenario. I think that going into a judo environment, and this actually has been my experience, you know, spending in the last couple of years, I've spent more time in an actual judo school with uh, with Shintaro Higashi and up at uh, Kokushi Budo Institute. And a judo class is very different than a jujitsu class. And a judo classroom is very different than a jujitsu classroom, not just in formality, but in the sort of intensity the um the way that techniques are approached and then how sparring and rendori runs so i really think if you're someone who's a blue belt and you go into it into a judo environment you need to be ready to it's uh to to graft in a way that's very active if that makes sense like it's not a one-to-one -one ratio it's not like a one-to-one -one analogy so you have to kind of do a little work to figure out, well, what do I really want to be spending my time doing? If you just want to get comfortable standing up and moving around and gripping, I think it's great. I think if you are if you want to learn judo, you should go to a judo school. I think if you want to learn standing jujitsu, it's a little bit different. Um, wrestling, I think that there, especially in the United States, there are more opportunities for people around the country at a at a younger age to start wrestling you know like there are wrestling programs and wrestling uh, you know people's high school wrestling there's college wrestling so there are all sorts of opportunities built into um, built into the culture here for wrestling experience and i think generally speaking um you know you can't go too wrong with wrestling i haven't spent much time in in just a wrestling environment so i can't speak you know with as an authority but single legs, double legs, if you're doing no gi, understanding how those things work, that's going to be very valuable to you. So yeah, to recap, you know, best of all worlds is your, your professor, your instructor feeds you gi and no gi standing stuff so that you know what to focus on. Second best, I think having a reasonable expectation if you're going into a judo uh, environment. And, um, and then I think, you know, being ready to learn how to wrestle and get some mechanics down. That's not going to hurt you when you go in and start doing no game. And I guess it's, it also has to do with goals too. You know, like uh, if 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 a student has specifically no gi aspirations and they don't plan right. on doing the gi at all, then I guess um, judo training. I'm not going to say like because there is a lot of things that do transition over, but certain gripping aspects and things like that probably wouldn't have any benefit to somebody who has no aspirations of uh playing in the gi um i was gonna ask what are the best and worst takedowns for bjj but i think off of what you said i'll rephrase my question what is uh what is necessary and what is not necessary in your mm -hmm. opinion from the standing position in terms of in techniques the, or yeah. uh, uh types of uh, types of throws types of takedowns yeah so broadly i think um there's a there is some overlap between gi and no gi, and I think that there are some in 
in the gi, I think uh, when we're talking about generally speaking, um, when we're doing takedowns from a standing position in the gi, in judo, a couple of things. One is turn throws are turn throws make a lot of sense in judo um, for 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 two reasons. One is uh, you can hit a strong turn throw um, and have a lot of success with putting somebody flat on their back. And that's a big part of doing judo is not just throwing the person, but ultimately getting them down onto the floor on their back. So turn throws can be very good for that. Taking the guy over, the girl over, you're rotating and you're you're really creating a flipping action where they're not they're more likely than not to land on their on their back. The second thing is that turn throws work great because the consequences of failure are not that high. They're high uh, in the sense that if we're continuing with Nawaza and you know you're you're going down on the ground, you have your back exposed. But in a judo context and in the way that most people train judo, you don't have that long really to work. So there's this really limited window for how long your back is exposed. And as a result, you can kind of take the risk. And if you fail, it's all about like kind of hanging on to prevent your partner from strangling you or turning you over. Um, in jujitsu, it's totally not the case. So turn throws, broadly speaking, are not really a good idea. There are some exceptions, but like all the classic, like uh, Morote Senagi, Ipon Senagi, um, even like Taitosh, um, those sorts of throws where you're really turning your back, even a Goshi, you know, like where you're trying for it, like those throws where you're giving your back to your partner, the consequences are really high if you fail in Jiu Jitsu because you, you, even if you succeed, you throw the person, and there's still a good chance that their chest is glued to your back because that's where you put it in order to throw them. Or you so roll as, through. Yeah, like exactly. Like you roll through or you drop and you put them down, but they crawl their way to your back because your arm is positioned across the center line. It just is, it kind of turns into a mess. And so when, when, if, if this is, if you're looking to learn, you know, standing takedowns with the gi, stay away for jujitsu stay away from turn throws it just doesn't make sense um, what if that what if you uh what if you have like an underhook like what if you're grabbing the belt and now th your arm can't come across the center line would you say that that statement is still true i think some some of it is, look if you're talking about like a, a hip throw or um you know really the throw the turn throws that i'm talking about are more like arms were going across the center line but even in a throw like a goshi, when you throw, there's a there's the opportunity for your partner to roll you through, right? And like if you're hitting a taitosh, same thing. Even if you hit a taitosh where your arm is not all the way across the center line, to get the power that you need in order to be able to throw somebody, there's going to be some follow through. Okay? It's kind of like tennis or golf where like, you know, people who hit hit successfully don't stop halfway. They go all the way through. And there's a, a likely, not, not, I don't know how high the likelihood is. I think it depends on the person who's doing it, but there's still the risk of getting rolled through. It becomes even clearer when you contrast that with methods of takedown in the gi that are less risky. Foot sweeps and uh, sutemi waz or sacrifice throws. So foot sweeps, one class of throws, sasai, kochi, oshigari, kosodagari, Relatively low risk, relatively low effort, um, lower amplitude generally, but the likelihood of either getting rolled through, getting your back taken in most cases is much lower. If you fail, then it functions a lot like a jab in boxing where you may not knock somebody out with your jab, but you can certainly use it to set up other things. And it's an incredibly good off balancing tool. Mm -hmm. So in terms of time spent on skills, foot sweeps and ashiwaza tend to be a better reward for jujitsu practitioners because the consequences are much lower. 
Also, the risk is lower, both the risk of back takes and like like bad consequences are lower, but also the risk of injury tends to be a little lower, you know? Yeah. Like you're not dropping your whole body weight into mm-hmm. a, a Sasai or Kochigari, you know? Yeah. Um, and then and Shutemi Waza. You, you, yeah, good. You can you can expose your partner's back through snap downs when you start threatening with Ochigari, Kochi. Just it's such a it's such a like you said, like it's a low risk. A uh, high percentage uh, type of strategy to threaten snap downs and foot sweeps. It, it doesn't cost you anything if if, if right. it fails. You know you're you're still right where you started. And uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. Just just like stumbling someone, you know. Instead, people ask me like, "Oh, I want to learn judo. I want to learn throws." And I'm like, first of all, I'm not. I haven't. I can do some turn throws, but it's not. I would say a big part of of my game. Um, and I'm just like, why don't we just focus on how to move your feet or how to uh, yeah. outgrip your opponent? It kind of the music, kind of the, the the space between the notes. You know what I mean? That's what I think is really important for jujitsu practitioners at the fundamental level is don't worry about how to do like a nice throw. You're never going to throw someone if you don't know how to uh, misalign their shoulders or how to make them stumble. So, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. No, um, that, that, that's right. I mean, I, I agree with you. I think if you want to learn to do those things, I think, and and I want to be clear about this too, I think if you want to learn to do those things, they're very worthwhile. You know, there's a value to them. I don't, I'm not really, you know, I don't really kind of, you don't hear it too much, or at least I don't hear it too much right now, but there is like kind of a, always a thread of people where they're like traditional martial arts, you know, don't work. Or they like to talk about how like, you know, it's only a pragmatic thing and like, you know, judo people, you know, you're going to turn, you're going to get your back taken or like if it's a judo guy versus a jujitsu guy and they do a turn throw, I'm going to take your back. I tend to avoid those kind of like, I, I think it's a like nonsensical debates. You know, I think that there's, a huge value to practicing judo as judo. I think there's a huge value to practicing even traditional martial arts. As long as you know what you're doing and what you're not doing, you know, like I think the mistake is a judo person going, well, you know, I do judo. And so it's basically the same as jujitsu because it's not. And, you know, a jujitsu person who's like, I do jujitsu. It's basically the same as judo. All I got to do is, you know, stand up. It's, It's just not the same thing. But, yeah, if we're doing jujitsu and we only have a limited amount of time, because like Matt, like you're a busy guy, it's like how much time are you, do you have actually to spend? First of all, on jujitsu, and then separate from that, learning, you know, a whole bunch of other stuff. You just don't mm-hmm. have that much time, you know. So being efficient with your with what you're learning is a huge part of it, and um, so I think your advice is is good advice. It's like learn the stuff that you're actually going to use, learn the stuff that's going to be functional for you. And it will allow you to funnel somebody into the thing that you're actually trying to do, which in, in our case is take somebody down, grapple on the ground, take their back, find a way to enter into a submission. Um, that sort of thing. So that's my, that's my take on it. Yeah. So I've, I've heard Danaher mention multiple times how he sort of will structure training for somebody at the fundamental level in jujitsu it's he, a lot of the time he says he works from the ground up right like escaping pins uh escaping submissions guard retention distance management and then uh, uh, essentially working your way backwards to the standing position because let's be honest in uh let's say an ibjjf rule set you could potentially be and there has been world champions who never do a single takedown right that's just not just under that rule set, I mean, ADCC is completely different. You have to train takedowns to fight in ADCC. But in IBJJF, you could literally pull guard every tournament and win. Um, my question to you, how important is learning fundam- uh, is learning takedowns at the fundamental level, would you say? Whether it's like uh, not just for a competitor, but for anyone, recreational you know, uh, do you, you think it's important for recreational beginners, regardless of their ambitions in the sport, how important is it for them to learn takedowns? And let's say you are, 
you know, you get a new white belt today sure. who comes into your gym yeah. and they want to learn jujitsu. And uh, let's say you did yeah. want to introduce takedowns to a fundamental student. Like, how would you begin to introduce uh, takedowns to them? I want to back up. It's a good question. What I would say, I want to go back one step, which is I think the problem with takedowns is that they're dangerous. And they're more dangerous than working on the ground. There are a bunch of reasons for that, but the most most evident one is you're two people standing up and one of you is going to fall down because the other one does something. So you have two bodies with force crashing together and then crashing down on the ground. And in order to move somebody, you have to use power and you have to use speed um, until you're at a, a high enough level where you can use like timing. So I think that if someone is going to learn, if you're going to teach, so if this is, if you're an instructor listening to this and you're going to teach someone how to do takedowns early on in their career, uh, in their practice, you need to have a safe enough training environment where it's not dependent on the technique that you're teaching them, but like the overall culture of the class allows them to remain safe because the easiest way to suck in jujitsu is to get injured and not train. You know, if you if you want to find someone like a, a really quick path to sucking, just don't show up. And if you get injured early on, even if it's with the right, you know, someone following our advice to do the right first technique and the environment is wrong or the attitude is wrong or, you know, like we were talking about, like those early days back at Henzo's, like if the, if, the environment doesn't support a safe way of training, then it's better not to learn any takedowns as a white belt or a blue belt. It's better to wait until purple or brown belt where you have some understanding of what the culture is and what your limits are and what the training is like and what it means just like kind of general body mechanics and movement and safety and like, you know, because you do learn something. If I sweep you with sumigashi, it's like a fall. So only you're learning it this, you know, this high off the ground, you're learning to tuck your chin and you're learning to roll. So when we stand up, if you have, if you've understood, not just like intellectually understood, but like in the court, you know, in the body, like you've understood how to fall safely, that's, that's going to help you, you know, Hey, there's your number one student making an appearance. Fucking cat, man. Ruining um, my show. Keep going. That's it. Ruining the show or, or saving the show. I don't know. It depends. <laughs> but, but look like, you know, if I, so in other words, like I think it's safer not to do any takedowns if the takedowns are not going to be done safely. And I want to bring that up because sometimes like even as instructors, we lose the forest for the trees and we feel like, you know, we're, we're doing our students a service by teaching them a single leg, but you're not doing your student a service if you're teaching them the single leg and then they go into a room of people who don't know how to fall and yeah. they do, they do a great single leg and their, their buddy lands on their leg and breaks it, which happens. I mean, this stuff happens all the time. So even by the way, even in judo schools, I mean, especially in judo schools, you get two white belts, they learn Osotogari and they go hacking at each other's knees and someone yeah. tears their meniscus. And that's the end of that person's career. So I think in the takedown discussion, one of the reasons why, you know, I think this is kind of like the, the the wisdom of, you know, Danner's vision for this is you end up doing the stuff that's least safe and you start with the stuff that's going to keep you safest the longest, escaping the pin, escaping the submission. So does that make sense as a frame? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, do you think IBJJF should do more to incentivize takedowns than they do and if so how would they do it um or is know, it good the I, way I mean, it I, is sport jujitsu is good if two guys pull guard i'm i i love pulling guard so i yeah. i'm not like i'm not one of these guys online that criticizes guard pullers oh that's not fighting yeah. blah 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 it's like it's sport jujitsu right so i have nothing against yeah. pulling guard but what do you what do you think in terms of ibjjf and their approach to takedowns you know they're 
every um, every organization or every event has a specific set of rules that govern the way that that uh, that tournament works. And so when you have people who want to win those tournaments, they're always going to direct their training towards like the path of least resistance for the win in a way, you know? So yeah, I'm, I'm in total agreement with you. I mean, I think that asking, uh, I don't think they need to change the rules. I mean, I think like, you know, if you want to, ADCC, if you take someone who wins in the AD, in ADCC rule set and you put them in IBJJF, and it it doesn't necessarily translate directly. With some people it does, but it doesn't really. You know, and it's why you have people winning in one rule set and they can't win in another or they don't win in another. Same thing EBI rules or submission only rules or whatever it is. There are always going to be people and, you know, athletes who want to win and so they narrow their focus into what that rule set is and i think that you just kind of accept the rules as part of the condition of what that what that environment is so um if if ibjjf were to incentivize uh standing you know a little bit more i think you would see people's training change in order to accommodate that. And I think some of it you'd probably see, and I haven't thought about it really enough to, to, to work through it, but you know, you would probably see some people whose positive standing increases. So like their standing skills increase. Generally you see people cross training with judo and developing a more uh, robust judo game. And then you would see another class of people who build entire practices around winning IBJJF, and having a kind of negative standing game, you know? And this is like the the arms race that takes place in every rule set of every organization. So if, if you had a situation where like IBJJF was like, okay, you know what? We're going to incentivize uh, standing. You would probably see more higher level people improving their stand-up um, but you might also have a bunch of unintended consequences where it gets micromanaged. And you see this in judo a lot now where it's like the rule sets are constantly updated and it's like, um, yes, you can break with two hands. No, you can't break with two hands. Well, next year, maybe you'll be able to break with two hands. You can't grab the leg. Well, you can grab the leg, but only in these cases. So I'm not really a fan of like over-regulating a particular rule set in order to be able to like, just like, you know, tweak these little things to get this perfect situation. Um, I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but I think that what we see is, by the way, a side note is I think that if, if you do see people, um, if you do see someone um, like IBJJF increasing like, incentivizing standing you're going to see more injuries i think especially among lower belt ranks you know um it won't last forever but you know it's like i don't know what's what's the worst guys. injury you've seen in training um the worst injury i've seen in training um thankfully you know i haven't i haven't seen I haven't physically been in the room for like any catastrophic injuries I don't think at least not like in the last 10 years and then I think maybe before then I might have just blocked it out um but I've been like proximal to a few and um you know I've seen I, I I've I've uh I've been around like there was a guy who broke his shin bone i think someone went for uh, it was a, something in the standing position that guys his shin bone broke like almost in half and you had like part of it sticking out it was just so bad that someone had to oh. come over and like that yeah, guy was like screaming and someone had to come over and like put a gi over the thing so like it was just disgusting it was like 
gross, you know, so we could, we didn't, you know, people didn't have to see it. Um, so like that, that kind of thing is pretty bad. Um, you, did you see that? No, I was there. I was actually, I saw the aftermath of it because it had happened, I think in the class, in the class before I was there. Uh, so like maybe it happened like 11 AM and I was there at noon. And so it was just kind of like, you know, everybody was on, on, um, on edge about that, you know, in, injury like that happens. And like the whole kind of psychic vibe of the place really goes haywire for a while. Um, Yeah, I don't, I don't really, I can't remember seeing like, like seeing somebody get their, you know, their, uh, their, sh like a shin broken or, um, you know, there have been injuries where it's like, you know, someone gets their knee popped, someone gets their ankle popped, um, someone gets their arm, you know, messed up or someone gets their shoulder torqued out of a Kimura. You know, I've had injuries myself. I had, you know, my, my meniscus, I had torn meniscus, you know, that was from like a toe hold. So like I've had some of my own injuries, but thankfully, knock wood, um, I haven't I haven't seen too many uh, catastrophic injuries. Yeah. So I I deal with my own meniscus issues. Do you, yeah. Did you get surgery? Do you? What is your uh, you know, um, what is your protocol for uh, prehab and recovery and yeah. things like that? I mean, I don't do as much prehab as I should, and over the years, I really. I wasn't doing very much cross training. I, my, my, my prehab, um, from 2005 to about 2015 was Muay Thai. You know, I was doing, I was doing a lot of Thai boxing for that 10 year period. And then I kind of tapered off and, and, um, you know, we were talking about like, you know, amount of time that you have to train. Uh, my son was born in 2015 and I was at this kind of inflection point where it was going to be very difficult for me to continue doing jujitsu and also like Thai boxing at the intensity that I was doing them prior to that. Um, I don't know if you have a family or kids, but that can, it's amazing, but it can throw a monkey wrench into your plans, you know? Um, so I, I made a decision then that I was going to not do Thai boxing quite as intensely. That was my that was my strength training. That was my preamp. That was my other stuff. And um, I did some yoga, you know, for a while. I was doing, I, I'm actually a big fan of like hot yoga. Uh, not necessarily Bikram yoga, but hot yoga. I think it's, for me, it's been um, being in that hot environment and kind of loosening everything up and going through some of those static postures and stuff like that. It's been very helpful. In terms of my meniscus, yeah, you know, like when it happened, my meniscus was torn in such a way where I couldn't walk. Uh, like I couldn't bend my knee. It was or my locked knee was out. kind of Yeah, it was locked out. It was like locked out in an angle like this. So I couldn't straighten it, I couldn't bend it, and I needed to have surgery in order to recover any kind of like useful function. So I went into I I had it um excised and I went into surgery pretty quickly, like maybe a couple days later, and then it was actually, it was the right choice uh, for me. I don't think people should like, you know, be going under the knife unnecessarily. But for me, it worked out great because I walked out. I couldn't walk into the hospital, but I walked out of it. And so they, they cut a piece out, I assume. They didn't stitch it. They didn't stitch it. They gave me the option to stitch it. If anybody is listening to this and you've had, you know, a meniscus issue, usually they'll give you an option of either stitching it to repair it or excising it. And if, if. They said, you know, if, if they were going to excise it, then, you know, recovery time was like maybe six weeks. Um, and then repair, it was like six months and a bunch of that time on crutches. Or even and this longer. Was at a, yeah, or longer. Yeah. So like this was at a time where I didn't want to lose the, I didn't, you know, I was doing jujitsu. I knew that it was something that I wanted to continue doing. And um, I just, I opted for them to take it out. And it was, it was a good, a good call for me. Um, and these days I still have problems, you know, it's like different sorts of problems, but you know, it still clicks around and sometimes my knee locks out. And, um, I mean, does your knee doing... lock out still? Yeah. Once in a while it does. And I got to kind of Fuck, jam it through. I yeah. You gotta unlock it. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's like, you've been around for like, if you train jujitsu for a long enough time, you're going to have some injuries, you know, and you get to the 20 year mark or whatever. 
And there's going to be some stuff that you're carrying around from 15 years ago. If you've trained well, and this is a separate topic, but I think if you've trained well, you haven't done so much damage to your body that you can't train in a normal way, um, like have normal expectations for your training, like continue to practice, do rendori, do some stand up, continue to progress and grow. And, you know, there aren't any positions. There's some positions that are going to give you a hard time. Maybe you're physically uncomfortable in them, but there's nothing that's like super off limits. I think the risk of hard training in a exclusively hard training in a way that's not done in an intelligent way early on in your practice is that if you do make it to year 10 or 15, uh, your body doesn't forget that you've, you know, had, had to do that and you end up suffering. And I know there are plenty of, uh, you know, people in my early cohort of jujitsu who are still around and, you know, it's, it ain't, they, they ain't doing that great. You know, some of them are doing great, but some of them it's hard, you know? So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I feel like I talk about it. I almost beat it like a dead horse on this show is the, uh, the ecological approach, right? This live training, right. the task focused right. games, a lot of people are like, oh, that's just target sparring or whatever. Um, other people are very much um, very much like fanatical and very uh, particular about their about how they perceive that type of training. So I, I now when I think about the ecological approach, I think about the previous training that I've done and I ask myself, was this a waste of time? You know, like drilling for reps and things like that. One thing that's big in uh traditional judo training and is still done pretty much I would say by every high level judoka at the Olympic level today is uh, uchikomi so doing entries right uh, counting entries trying to trying to work on your mechanics and your speed and your intensity while you're doing these repetitions but to me that kind of flies in the opposite direction of the ecological crowd who says no it needs to be live training Um, you know, just doing entries and speed drills doesn't necessarily equate to the development of skill or the ability to be able to use these techniques against someone who's resisting, someone who's moving, who's gripping you, uh, breaking your grips, et cetera. Um, how, how do you feel about like the traditional methods, Uchikomi, speed training, drilling, um, maybe not even just in the standing position, but on the ground, what's your opinion on that as opposed to how it can transfer or develop skill into a student i can only speak about my own experience and my experience has been um you know i i came up drilling not drilling in a really in an uchikomi sense although i i i I think uchikomi practice is important and i'll give it a kind of put an asterisk by that and give a caveat in a second but um drilling to become familiar with the mechanics of the technique is valuable and has been valuable to me you know it's a valuable i think it's a valuable thing and um i prefer to think about it as understanding a technique or a set of techniques in isolation versus understanding a set of techniques in context. And in any, this is true in most other fields also. You can isolate something and get an understanding of it. And there's nothing wrong with that understanding. But if you have an, it's separate from an understanding of the thing in its context. And what's, I think that what the debate or whatever the discussion is about from what I have gathered is that it's like well on one side we have we have this idea that there can be kind of technical development in isolation through like uchikomi or drilling and then on the other side you have um people who say that no it needs to be in context and that's like where you're really you're really getting the um kind of the true essence of what's going on because you're you're taking the thing and you're putting it into a context where someone is resisting, maybe not too hard, but you're narrowing down the focus and you're going like, okay, this is the same sort of thing. We're kind of at the end of the day, you're trying to build the same kind of 
uh, try to get to the same outcome, but one of them is in context and one of them is more in isolation. And so if you look at Uchikomi just as an example, it's like the ultimate isolation drill where you have a partner who's relatively static and you're doing all of the work. And it's this kind of way of putting things under a microscope. You know, are, are your feet where they're supposed to be? Um, are you, is your arm where it's supposed to be? And a lot of that has to do with developing um, just, ba you know, basic step-by-step -step movements and then also kind of a feel for things. Because as you know, there is an element of jujitsu, which is you have to feel it. There is a tactile thing in the sense that um, it's beyond just the intellectual understanding of what an arm lock is. If you hit an arm lock and you do jujigatami from the guard and it's on, you know it's on even without like having mapped it steps one, two, and three. And even if you do steps one, two, and three, you may get there and be like, you know what, it's just, it's not right. You know it's not right. And sure enough, a second later, your partner pulls out. So there is a sense of feel that you want to develop. And I think that in my experience, I I really like Uchikomis. I like Uchikomis for, one, I think that um, developing speed and like speed of entry, speed of exit, that's an important thing, in at least in Judo. In Jiu-Jitsu, entering things quickly is less important. But understanding how your body fits into your partner's body, some people need to kind of slow that down and take it out of context and put it in isolation so they can see the pieces. Um, and then uh, I like the kind of, it, you know, it's a good, um, it's a good cardio in a way. You know, if you do, if you want to get tired, do 500 Osodagaris. It's like, you're going to be fucking tired after the end of that. It's not going to be that easy. And so I think there are some benefits. Um, and then I think on the other side, you need to be able to put things in context. It doesn't make sense to understand how to do Osodagari if you don't understand the setup and the movement and how your partner's moving and where it fits and when, what do you do it before and what do you do it after and what are the prerequisites and feeling body weight and feeling your partner moving and feeling when they're off balance, all that stuff. So I think you get in a sparring, like a lighter sparring or um, kind of a contextual situation, you get some of those soft skills that are very difficult to build in just the drilling. But in the drilling, you get the... Um, you get these things in isolation, which allow you to kind of pinpoint in a way that might be difficult if you are, if there are a lot of other things going on in a context, if that makes sense. Um, the broader point to me is that as with like a lot of things, it's not what you're doing, it's how you're doing it. And repetition for the sake of repetition, it, it it's, I'm not going to go so far as to say it does. It's, not, it's useless, but it's of real limited utility, you know, just repeating things. And one thing that I, I, I tell my students this also, but, you know, you can have two people and one person has five years of experience and the other person has one year of experience five times. So they've both been practicing for five years. And, you know, you may have done 500 Uchikon, you know, 500 Osodagaris. Do you have... 500 repetitions worth of Osodagari or do you have like 10 repetitions that you just kind of mindlessly went through till you got to number 500 and I'm never going to be in favor of empty mindless totally un non contextualized repetition for anything um, just as on the other side I'm not going to be a, a fan of less than your best most precise execution of a technique so that's i think i kind of land somewhere in the middle um if, if that makes sense to you yeah absolutely <clears throat> I, I i agree I, I i'm pretty much right on the same path as you you know i think i think drills as long as you're drilling with intent and um drilling for precision i i think it's i think it's totally valid uh, but um if you don't mind, I'd like to shift the conversation towards sort of your, you and your school, <clears throat> excuse me, and your program, uh, if that's all right. So your gym, if I'm not mistaken, is, is it Brooklyn BJJ? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, how, when did you open your school? 
Um, so I started, uh, I, I have a partner of mine. I, I, um, I started, uh, we started the school uh, in 2005. And so we had, um, we had pre-pandemic, we closed one of the schools in, uh, in 2020, um, because the lease was actually coming up and we were having issues with the landlord. And I don't know how it was where you are, but in New York, it was pretty tough to have a brick and mortar jujitsu martial arts school, um, going. And if it wasn't for the, the, um, landlords who were helping you know kind of allow us to to make things work it would have been really difficult to get through so we had one that wasn't that cooperative and but now anyways we have three schools first one was in 2005 and then um they were they they grew uh they grew from there mm. um do you do you have like a kids program there yeah we have kids we you know we we teach kids we teach adults um you teach the kids I, think, I don't teach the kids myself not anymore um i used to teach kids uh through i don't know first 10 years or so um i was teaching kids and i don't i don't teach them now um mostly because i have my own kid and a lot of my my time goes to that but um you know, I think a kids, I think kids programs are have you know present their own challenges for people who are in jujitsu, running jujitsu schools. Um, you know, one one thing about a kids program is that jujitsu tends to be you know more technical than other types of martial arts, and as a result, it can be it, it has some challenges, especially with younger kids. Um, mm -hmm. I think a kind of like more contextual model like the one you were talking about like that is something that kids can get where they're actually moving and building live skills and it's like less eco of training a, yeah yeah like it, it exactly like a kind of more uh ecological approach i think can be good for kids because it allows them to move and develop more holistic skills ultimately kids you know they what do they need they need uh they need coordination they need gross motor skills they need to understand balance they need to understand distance movement how their bodies are in space where their bodies are in space um what it feels like to pull or push and you know how to land safely how to fall safely and a lot of that stuff they they know already so it's more just about funneling it into a jiu-jitsu context um the other challenge of course is that when you're teaching kids you're also having to teach the parents in a way so yep. generally speaking, that's the bigger challenge, um, which is why I think if you if it's possible for people, I think parents should be training jujitsu. You know, the Suzuki method. It's interesting. Uh, the one of the tenants. I don't know if you ever did music lessons when you were a kid, but you know, the Suzuki method is like the preeminence was the preeminent like violin method for. Um, I, it may still be for for kids learning violin, and it was kind of like uh, it was a movement. Maybe back in the eighties, or uh, it may have started a little bit before. Like I did, I remember when I was a, a little kid, and they start kids like age three, you know, or maybe even younger with violin. But one of the among the many things that they do, one of the things that they focus on is the parent has to do, like parent also has to take violin lessons. You don't have to like continue it, but especially at the beginning. And I think what they figured out was that if the parents are doing the lesson, number one, they can be more helpful to the kids. Number two, they understand some of the challenges that go into practicing something that you're not that great at. And it gives parents a little bit more uh, empathy for what's going on when their kids are trying to learn something. So the best students that I've, the best junior students I've ever had have been students whose parents are also training. And um, so I think that if someone, you know, if, if you're listening to this and you're teaching jujitsu or you're a school owner um, and you're struggling with your kids program, a good recommendation is try to get more parents on the mat and uh, it's going to make life a lot easier. It's also more fun for everybody. 
Um, yeah, I yeah. absolutely agree. Um, I think you're, I also absolutely agree with what you said about the ecological approach in kids. I've talked about that before on the show is yeah. that's actually where I think the eco approach truly shines is when you're dealing with um, uh, children who, especially from ages, say five to nine, five to 10, where you can't easily show them techniques and then expect that they're going to be able to do the techniques or even drill the techniques with interest. A lot of the time, I mean, I'll be teaching kids and like, if the gym door opens and someone walks in, they immediately stop watching what I'm doing and they're watching what they're doing. So it's just like, it's really challenging to hold their uh, attention. But if you put a kid in a single leg and you say, okay, you have 40 seconds to escape the single leg. If you don't do that, you lose. If you fall on your butt, you lose. And then you just say, go. Now they're like, oh shit, like uh, I can lose this. That Now I have to try. I'm forced to now right. apply myself and then and then constantly switching it up. So I was defending 10 seconds ago. Now I'm attacking. It just keeps them interested, you know, and, and at the same time, they're building that motor skills. Whereas, you know, just the explicit instruction, I think, for kids of that age, um, they do struggle even just trying the move, uh, you know, so, I, I mean, even adults do. I mean, I think, it, I, of course, you know, adults struggle and it's like now have a seven or eight year old kid trying to do like, I don't know what, like a spider guard sweep or, you know, collar drag to, you know, bow and arrow. It's going to be, you're going to have, what will happen is you, first of all, you got your work cut out for you. Second of all, the instructor is going to get, you know, it's frustrating. It's difficult to do sometimes, you know? So yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no worries. Have you ever, uh, in your journey, have you ever known John Danaher to teach children? No. I mean, I've only seen him do, you know, Nicky Ryan was, you know, 14 or 13 or 14 or something like that when he first showed up. So um, I don't know if that, that counts exactly, but, um, and then like every once in a while there have been, there would be kids floating through, but these were not the kid, you know, when you and I are talking about kids, we're talking about kids who are um you know either w w new white belts or you know kids who are in the community that your school is in and the parent wants them to improve and grow the, the only kids that i I've, I've ever seen him teaching were kids who whose parents were crazy enough to bring them to the noon class in the blue basement at henzo's in midtown manhattan and uh you know i think that has that's a particular kind of parent and um also it's a particular kind of kid whose parent understands that that environment is not going to be totally too much for them um so I, I i don't i haven't seen him like you know jumping in to teach the you know kids fundamental class um but I also haven't seen him jump in to teach the uh, adult fundamental class either. I think that that's not his, his um, you know, I think he could do it, but I think it's not in his wheelhouse that he doesn't, his attention somewhere else, you know. But I think it's challenging. You know, kids teaching kids, working with kids, it can be very challenging. And I think it requires, you know, a, a great instructor like we were talking about, you know, if you're going to teach kids, I think that you need to be, you know, takes an ungodly amount of patience. Um, you have to have a real passion for it and a vision for it. And like you were saying, like a, uh, an idea of not just kind of bending kids into the, the shape that you want them to be in, but understanding what will allow them to bend themselves into the shape that's appropriate for them so that they can get the most out of their training. And often those things don't, don't overlap, you know? It can be, it can be, it can be challenging, but worthwhile. Mm -hmm. um, the, the sport of jujitsu has moved along very quickly. I would say in the last five to 10 years, especially in the last five years. Right. Um, what do you think is the, the biggest contribution to that uh, <laughs> rapid growth over the last decade? Like what's, what's caused jujitsu to grow the most? Well, I think those are two different questions because okay. you could look at the sport growing in terms of a spectator sport with what's going on in ADCC. Yeah. I'm talking more about the technical development of the sport. 
Um, and you know, like with the leg locks and, and even mm-hmm. if you, if you want to go back slightly further, like Barambolos, things like that, mm-hmm. um, the technical developments and advancements that we've seen over the last five to 10 years, what do you think is the biggest factor that has influenced that? I think you have more people doing jujitsu now than ever before. And there's a greater pool of people. And there's a greater pool of people who are coming to this younger. So you have people who are starting the whole, you have more people, you have more of those people starting younger. And then you have the, um, the, uh, kind of recognition machine that is fueling people to do more, uh, and to kind of reach these higher levels where there's some kind of reward, uh, financial, uh, like recognition, um, you know, prestige, those sorts of things. So back, if, if you look back 15 or 20 years ago, number one, there weren't that many people doing jujitsu. There just were not as many practitioners. Um, number two, people who were coming to the martial arts, if you were a kid doing martial arts, you were starting with a traditional martial art. You were, and I think that by and large, that's still true, but you were starting with Taekwondo, you're starting with karate. You might be starting with judo. You were starting with wrestling. And then you would eventually maybe get to jujitsu, but it would be much later. You know, uh, jujitsu was kind of a thing that adults did. It was self-defense. It was like, you know, bare knuckle fighting. It was UFC. It was not stuff that was well suited for children to be doing in most cases. So you didn't have as many younger people doing it, which meant that the timeline for the training wasn't as great. And then lastly, if you look back, the, there was no real, um, you know, golden ring. Like you know, there wasn't anything really for people to chase. I am. I think that... You know, I think that there is, my opinion is, I think there's sometimes too much emphasis on ex- external um, kind of rewards and external, like people are too externally motivated, I think. Um, but that, that's just my opinion. There didn't, that stuff didn't exist back in the day. You know, like I was saying, like the kind of the big promise for jujitsu when I started was like someone would climb the ranks to fight in pride. And it was this like Mount Everest. Some people could summit it, but most people couldn't. And even more people than that would look at it and be like, that's way too big a mountain to climb. Now I think that there's, um, there's obviously like there are financial incentives. There are like gear companies and sponsorships. There's prize money. There is, um, you know, social media recognition. There's all of this stuff where people are like, oh, I want to do that for this reason. Or it, I don't want to sound too jaded. I think that, you know, it's it's an additional exter, external motivator for people who might otherwise already be internally motivated to, to train, you know, to do jujitsu. So if you look at the people who, like some of the major standouts in the last however many years, it went from, and I don't know this for sure. I'm sure someone can like do the, like the meta-analysis of this, but I bet you that the median age of people who are like considered innovators or like really high level practitioners or winning stuff has dropped down because you had like the Mendez brothers who were, you know, these guys were phenoms in, you know, their teens or, you know, like even like mid teens, Meow, same thing, Uh, Rotolo, same thing. Um, You know, you have these younger, Cole Abate, Nicky Ryan, you know, even you know, Gordon, when he started, was a little bit like older, but he's the guy was still, you know, 18 or whatever it is. So that was, that was, you know, that's like 10 years of, of training that we, you know, it wasn't even like really considered. So I think as a result of that, you have more people, more time. And then when you start younger, you have fewer of these inhibitions uh physical or mental or you know less baggage you know you have people who are the people who are going to shine are going to shine earlier they're encouraged more and then they kind of continue to go and 
So you have that. And then you have, you know, technical innovations when something comes up because you have more people digging around in what that is. If something is really effective or works really well, because you have a broader pool of people who are practicing it, that thing kind of like tectonically like pushes everything up. And so you end up with the people who are older or, you know, people who are not early adopters or don't have as much time to, to, to train because they have jobs or responsibilities. They can still see the results of that pushing up. And so, you know, leg locks is a good example, you know, even though leg locks, you know, I might, my thing about leg locks is that's a system that Danner took Danner 20 years to develop. You know, he was working on that, you know, his, his version, you know, I know he didn't invent, you know, all, all leg locks and stuff, but like our approach was 20 years in the making from a guy who had basically given up everything to sit in a basement and teach and train jujitsu for, you know, literally guys on the mat, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. So I think particularly for for jujitsu and like our thing that was the seed planted the rain coming the sun shining and the, the the seed underground kind of like pushing up pushing up pushing up and then it comes up and there's a crop and everybody's like oh we got corn amazing you know and it well you know wasn't here yesterday and then now here it is today well not the whole story, but I don't know. That's a long answer. Uh, I think that if you look at this, it's like a combination of like structural things and external factors. And then you have people who are, you know, in ADCC, if something works and there's a big, a big prize at the end of it, again, prestige or money or whatever, you're going to have more people who want to learn that thing if it's going to help them to get closer and you end up with a kind of built-in evolutionary engine that's going to get things going a little bit faster than it would if there was no incentive and nobody training which is how which is how it was in like 2001 so i often wonder because i'm a huge fan of uh danaher's instructionals and gordon's instructionals i i watch them a lot probably <clears throat> Probably to the point where I now I question uh, what would I teach if I didn't have these resources, you know, like right. these resources are so available. And from what I've heard, I've, I've heard Gary Tonin say, you know, as amazing as John Danaher is as a grappling coach, he's just as knowledgeable in the striking arts, if not more. So I'm like, yeah. it's crazy the level of knowledge of John Danaher the the understanding of his mechanics i when i started watching him was really what um you know what really uh turned me on to him like i had heard obviously oh his gsp's coach you know we love gsp up here in canada but yeah. i uh, when i started watching his dvds i was like this guy's got the craziest level of detail with his mechanics and he's got these yeah. like little landmarks with you know oh if 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 uh, if my leg is in this position, then it doesn't work. I need my knee to be above this guy's ear or whatever, you know, and then, and, and these little, uh, these little details, um, maybe you've already answered this question. Where did he get this information from just f from surrounding himself with jujitsu? Is he just like, uh, is there a, le a level of autism that's involved in it just to be that, dialed in when it comes to take to absorbing this knowledge he is an unbelievably um his ability to observe and distill and then communicate details and also what is going on in an otherwise very complex set of events is uncanny. And I'm sure there are people in the world who have a similar kind of um, set of attributes and, and skills when it comes to that. I just don't think they're doing jujitsu. I don't think they're doing martial arts. I don't think they're in, in this world. I think that they're probably you know they're in they're in medicine they're in um political 
science, they're in tech, they're in mathematics, they're in something else. And so we have this incredible like person who has, for whatever insane reason, dedicated their their gifts to what you know this this work and so uh the, the short answer is part of he, his obs- his ability to observe and then distill and understand is just off the charts and um i think that's the biggest difference because you know back in the day there wasn't that much we didn't have YouTube, you know, we had like videos every once in a while, something would surface. Um, but it wasn't really, you know, there wasn't much of it, but at the same time, the stuff that he was seeing, he was able to draw out of those, you know, thousands of people were seeing the same thing, but they weren't seeing the stuff that he was seeing. They were watching the same thing. They weren't seeing it. And, um, so he was doing that back then. And I think he can do it for striking. And I think he does it for for judo. And I think he does it for jujitsu. And I think he can do it for wrestling. And um, you know, ultimately, as practitioners, something that I've found is the problem that one of the one of the issues that we face is that we used to have a problem where there wasn't enough information. You know, there was kind of like a scarcity of information. We, you know. We don't, there was an arm lock variation that we had never seen before. Okay. Um, in a in a, an environment like that, the solution to that problem is you get the information about the arm lock variation, then you've learned it, and then you're then you've got it right, and you kind of keep doing this. It's this ability uh, to gain and gather new information. That's not really the essential skill anymore, and I re- I think that if you come to things from you know, the Dan or her perspective, that's not really the skill that hasn't been the skill for a long time. But actually the skill is filtering out the unnecessary information and funneling through into what you do and what you're focusing on and what your attention is on, focusing on only those things that, that matter. Now, That's a really, it seems very simple. Okay, all I've got to do is filter out the stuff that doesn't work and I'm left with the stuff that works. But that's a huge job. And it requires a a very unique intellect and a very unique way of observing and a balance between understanding detail and seeing the big picture. And I think there are a lot of people who see detail very well. And this is not a knock on anybody, but... I think that there are plenty of people who can do great breakdowns, um, you know, like YouTube and Instagram and like people do like these breakdowns of technique, but it's one thing to be able to do a breakdown. It's something else to be able to like figure out a way to determine if what that breakdown is about is worthwhile and valuable and, and, and meaningful enough to bring into the training and then how to link it to a bigger picture. So there are a lot of people who can do the detail. And then there are other people who can do big picture thinking, you know, um, think strategy and understand context and that sort of thing. But marrying the two of those is a very, it's a very rare thing. So how did, you know, how he can do it? I don't, I don't know. Um, But what it involves is this like Sherlock Holmes, you know, um, you have, you know, Sherlock Holmes is this, you know, like two, you know, someone will be sitting there and they'll have a conversation and the person will leave and they'll turn to, you know, Watson and he'll be like, the mystery is solved. And Watson is like, you know, Watson is kind of like the stand in for the, you know, all of us. Cause we're like, what are you talking about? You know, I saw this guy sitting here. I didn't see anything. Nothing was weird. And so then Sherlock Holmes goes and says what he saw that was actually the key to unraveling the whole thing. And so in many ways, I think that it's that kind of intellect that is just, you know, I think it's rare. I think it's a rare intelligence that that allows him to do that. But kind of to bring it back to your thing, 
I think he can do it with striking. He can do it with kickboxing. He can do it with Muay Thai. He can do it with MMA. And, uh, you know, I wish I could do it. <laughs> you know, instead, I just, I have to set, I have to be satisfied with being, you know, proximal to someone who can. And also, like I said, the kind of very beginning is, I think as students, whether it's Dan or her or someone else who is in line with your approach is being comfortable enough to take your hands off the wheel and go like, this person's a better driver than me. You know, like, it's fine. Uh, I don't need to do everything. I want to learn as much as I can. And I think if we're good students, then we're willing to do that. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, that's all I got for you today, Brian. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate your insight. The content you put out is really amazing, guys. I recommend you check out uh, Brian's YouTube channel and also his DVDs on BJJ Fanatics. Uh, Brian, can you let us know where we can find you? Yes, thanks. So first of all, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. And I really, pleasure. really enjoy talking to you. Um, I'm on Instagram, BZ Glick. And um, my, my YouTube channel, I think might be the same, but if not, if you just put my name in, Brian Glick, it should bring up the, uh, the channel. And then... Uh, BJJ Fanatics, you know, I have these uh, right now we've got a couple of videos out that cover some topics that I learned from Danaher, you know, they're not not ideas that I came up with, they're very much kind of in line with this conversation and uh, and uh, if you have a, if you're if you have a chance to check those out, then, you know, that would be great Awesome, we'll leave links in the show notes for anyone who's looking to follow you, and again I really recommend checking out uh, Brian Glick's content. Guys, I really uh, thank you for joining us for this discussion, and also if you want to support the show, I'll leave the links in the bottom the online academy, my online merchandise store, plus my PayPal account if you want to leave a donation, please leave uh, comments in the comment section and um, I'm going to let you go thank you so much for the conversation Mr. Brian Glick. Thanks Matt this was great, appreciate it all right, and remember, Essential Jiu-Jitsu Podcast, everything you need to know about jiu-jitsu. Take care, guys.